Um, so welcome everybody. Sorry for the delay getting started. Uh, Father Thomas comes to us uh, the whole way from Markham or Newmarket or somewhere far, far, far away. Uh, and uh, I thought it would be nice to have a different voice, a different face. Um, and uh, someone, uh, we're, we're kind of cut from the same cloth, except Abuna is a little bit more polite than I am. Um, but just just a little bit, though, just a tiny little bit. So uh, without any further ado, and Abuna doesn't need any introduction, uh, he's from St. Maurice and St. Verena, our, uh, one, another beautiful Coptic church here in the city. Um, so, uh, yeah, without any further ado, Abuna. All righty. I'm so, so sorry about the delay. I Listen, I come from Ottawa. Ottawa is a small city. You get everywhere within 15 minutes. I know I've been here for five years, but I'm still not used to this 45 minutes like uh, business. But anyway, so I'm so sorry. I was actually in Aurora. We had, uh, my kids had hockey, so uh, I'm a coach of one of my kids. So I was actually on the ice. So I just kind of jumped off. I don't go on the ice with this, if you guys are wondering. I change. Uh, so, so sorry about the delay. Uh, thank you for uh, for accepting my my apology, even though you guys are not accepting it, it seems like it, but whatever. <laughs> uh, so I'm so happy to be here. Uh, Father uh, John asked me to speak about, I think you guys are going through the liturgy, and the liturgy is, uh, and you guys are at the part of Thanksgiving. And for any of you that know me, Thanksgiving, the Thanksgiving prayer is one of my favorite prayers in the whole church. Uh, I actually believe this is a miracle working prayer. It's a prayer that we should have at the tip of our tongue. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, exactly how it is in the Coptic Reader, but just that spirit of thanksgiving brings us to a whole new place. And actually, it's really important in the church that you we understand the prayer of thanksgiving and that we live that life of thanksgiving. Because if you look at all our liturgies, all our liturgical uh, services, they all start off with the prayer of thanksgiving. There's nothing that we do in the church without the prayer of thanksgiving. We start off a funeral with the prayer of thanksgiving. We start off a wedding with the prayer of thanksgiving. Some people say those are the same, but they're not the same. They're, uh, you know, some people, you know, we do a liturgy, we pray the prayer of thanksgiving. You know, a, a while ago, I mentioned that there was a, a Russian, um, Russian ambassador in the 10th century that was sent to uh, Constantinople. And when he went to Constantinople, he was asked to go visit a church and so forth and other places. And then when he came back, he had to report back to the prince of Russia and say, hey, what, what did you notice? And he told them, when I went to the church, the only thing that he could say is like, I didn't know whether I was in heaven or on earth. But one thing that I knew was that Christ was in our midst. And that quote really stuck to me ever since I read it, because I wonder how that is for you and I during liturgy. Nowadays, do we actually say we don't know whether we're in heaven or on earth? Like we come to liturgy day in and day out, and we, we know what's supposed to happen, and we know what the next response is going to be. We know all of those things. But yet, are we able to stand and say, I didn't know whether I was in heaven or on earth, but one thing that I knew that Christ was in our midst. We pray this, and I think you did at the beginning, like the, the offertory, and I don't know if you touched on the book of hours as well, but we pray in the third hour, you know, O Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who's present in all places. And I wonder sometimes, do I actually believe those words that I'm praying, those words that I'm saying? You know, up until recently, I had a really hard time understanding this quote that this Russian ambassador had, how can you enter a church you've never entered in your life and say those words? Say that you didn't know whether you're in heaven or on earth. But one thing that I knew was that Christ was in our midst. You know, and I hope that we all experience that at some point in our life during liturgy. Recently this summer, I went to Zambia with a group of youth from our church. And I don't know if any of you have done, any of you done a mission trip? Anyone? Have you been to Africa or where have you been? Nigeria. Nigeria. Amazing. And there's something about... So the rest of you haven't? No? Abuna. So you got to get them. <laughs> you got to get them. Going. This is my first time going to Africa. It was my first time this summer and it was life-changing. 
not in a way that I'm gonna I'm up and leaving and going to Africa. No, I I loved my experience in Africa, but I also love experiencing God here. But when we were in Africa, there was something about being distraction free, that I was there and that I woke up with a purpose of being with God. That I went to liturgy and it was like the purpose wasn't me being a priest. It was me to be like with God. I would set my alarm and it would be the purpose of doing quiet time. And I can't, like I confess that when I came back from Zambia, maybe I did it for a little bit, but I kind of fell off that wagon pretty quickly. That I didn't set my, my alarm became all of a sudden, I set my alarm so that I could get on with my day. It wasn't anymore like a place of, like I'm waking up with the intention of being with God. And that's why I love when churches do series like this with the intention of like, okay, yes, we're going through the rubrics. We're going through like what you're supposed to do in liturgy or what we're saying and so forth. But it's good for us to, uh, to understand. In the, in the early church, like if you look at the early church, and when I mean early church, I mean like, you know, first, second, third, fourth century. These are the early church. What, what's the difference of the early church versus our church nowadays? Like, what's, what's the difference? Like, in the early church, one of the things, and there was a quote from Tertullian, and he says, in the early church, Christians were made not born. Nowadays, it seems like Christians are just born. Like, we're born into Christianity. Like, my son was born, so I'm going to baptize him. Like, that's what happened. That's how he becomes a Christian. But in the early church, they were made. They would come to a church and there was a heavy, heavy, heavy like emphasis on the catechesis part of the church. And that's why when you look at our church and you look at the structure of the liturgy, you look at it in a way that there is a structure that it was mainly education. Where did people learn to be Christians was through the liturgy. It wasn't through like, you know, sitting in meetings. Sorry, I know we're sitting in a meeting right now, but like sitting in meetings and so forth. It was through the community through the liturgy, that they would come to the liturgy and that they would learn and that they would grow and then they would become, you know, uh, baptized and so forth. Christians were made and that they, were, they weren't born. There was like a heavy emphasis on this education portion. But the thing is, is that the way that the education was done at the time was very different than how you and I do it nowadays, is that their education was through a liturgical experience. It wasn't through just sitting in a classroom. It wasn't through just listening to a lecture and so forth. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that. But what I'm saying is that maybe we're missing something sometimes when we kind of like put more emphasis on education through a classroom versus the actual experience. There's this, um, there's this uh, Greek Orthodox guy. His name is... Uh, Stephen, he does be the bee. What's his name? Anyways, he does be the bee. And they did in their church, they did a study on why the young adults leave the church. Uh, and it's called effective ministry. They actually put a whole course on about this. And a few of our servants at SMSV, we did it together. We wanted to understand like, what is, what is this course about? And one of the things that he said was, is that he said that the reason why young adults and people leave the church is because the church has become a place of information and no longer a place of transformation. That you used to walk into a church and it used to be the place of transformation, not a place of information. All of a sudden, what has happened? Our churches have become places of information. When you're a kid, you go to Sunday school. When you're a youth, you go to an older Sunday school called youth group. And then when you're an adult, you end up going to young adult meetings, which is just Sunday school, but with bigger language. That's all we have done. We have transferred information to information to information, and we haven't lived a life of transformation. Why am I speaking about transformation when you're supposed to be speaking about Thanksgiving? Because there's no transformation if you don't come to a place of Thanksgiving. If you don't have an attitude of Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving is what transforms our heart. The last two, this, this past Sunday and this Sunday, we're going to hear the parable of the sower, right? The parable of the sower. And we know that parable and we've heard that parable uh, many times. And that parable describes different soils that seeds have fell upon. And that the soil is what? 
what is what do the church fathers say that the seed is the, the sorry that the soil is our hearts correct that at a certain part at a certain time in our life our hearts are going to be either hard soil are going to be rocky soil are going to be good grounds are going to be thorny grounds but at some point that's what our heart is going to be but we need to cultivate like if you go to anybody uh, at a certain point if you go to anybody uh, and you speak about um, like how do you garden they're going to say the most important thing is two things is take care of the soil and take care of the soil you have good soil then you have a good opportunity for good growth you know when i was younger and actually i described my life before and i don't know if i described it here or in my church uh, at smsv but i described my life as this life imagine uh, like a jar full of seeds that's what my life is for the last 30 plus years 30 plus years of my life i've been attending church i've been so 40 40 plus years now okay 40 plus years of my life i've been attending church and what i have been doing is i've been going and been listening to sermons and i'm like wow that's a good sermon and i take that seed and i put it in the jar and then the next thing is that i take you know i hear a church father quote and i take that seed and i put it in the jar and then uh, i hear uh you know i read a verse and i put it in the jar and my jar is beautiful and i have many jars and there's different seeds and all of these things it's all it's all wonderful i'm i promise you my jar looks amazing but there's no growth there's no growth because my seed that's all i've been doing i've been taking these seeds these bits and pieces and I've been coming to a place and saying like, okay, I want to keep this jar nice and neat. But I haven't been planting it in good soil. That's my life. And I promise you, I'm not just saying this to you. That has been my life for 30 plus years. I haven't allowed for any transformation to happen in my life. I've been uh, outwardly, the jar looks good. The seeds look nice. But inwardly, they're not doing what they're supposed to do, which is to be transformed and to grow. We know that all things start with a small, something small, and it could turn out to be something great. This particular parish started off by a little seed, and it's now flourished to what you see right now. The church in North America is the same. It started off in one church at St. Mark's. It was a very small church, and now look what has happened in North America. It starts on a small seed. Small things that are planted on good soil could could have transformation and could have growth there are there are businesses that are out there there's a business that i know of that is now a four billion dollar revenue company and it started off by selling t-shirts in the back of their trunk that company's under armor go look at what under how the under armor start under armor started with somebody selling t-shirts in the back of their their trunk and they became now a four billion dollar revenue it starts small but we need transformation there's an orthodox theologian that says every word in the gospel is only a seed, only the beginning of an endless process of development. And that's what I'm wondering, is that when we're sitting here, are we approaching things with a way that it's a seed that is towards an endless process of development? We have to allow for good soil to happen. To good soil to happen, we have to start with what the church has taught us from the very beginning which is the prayer of thanksgiving. You know, when we're young, we teach kids to pray. How do we teach them to pray? What do we say? We teach them the sign of the cross. And then what do we say? We say, you thank God for, for everything. So what do the kids do? They do the sign of the cross. And then they say, we thank you God for everything. That's what they do. But then when it comes, and that's what we still do as adults sometimes. And that's what we do in the church. If you read the prayer, because it's, a, it's a, a community prayer that we're praying all together. So it's harder to make it personalized when it's a community prayer. So we say we thank you, God, for, what does it say on the screen? For every condition, concerning every condition and all conditions. You don't have to put it up. It's, you know, that's what we pray. But what happens in that prayer? Where are we supposed to be transformed? Why is the church telling us and putting it at the very beginning of the prayer? And this is, when I say the very beginning of the liturgy, it's actually at the very beginning of the liturgy because it's prayed in matins at the beginning and then later on it's prayed 
during the uh, like right after the offertory, right, right before the liturgy of the word. Why? Because we need to get to a place of like that our hearts become mush. The only way that our hearts become like the soil that is ready is through the prayer of thanksgiving. It's through the prayer of thanksgiving. You know, when we approach things, we need to approach it with a heart of repentance. We've heard this many times. And I'm sure Buna John has preached about repentance numerous times. That's the go-to for all priests, by the way. That's here. I'll give you a little, you know, when we don't know what to preach about, we say repent. That's what we say. But unfortunately, sometimes we don't know what that actually means. Like we don't like we say it, we understand it, but when we grew up, maybe repentance was like this very negative, there was this negative connotation. Like if you ask younger people, if you serve younger people in the parish, ask them what repentance is, they're gonna say stuff like sorry for sins, feel you know, sad for sins. Uh, there's a sorrow, it's almost like a negative. But we know nowadays, we know that repentance is not negative right? Repentance is this turning, this turning towards God. And it's, yes, we understand what it means. We know that it's metanoia in Greek. We know, like we know, and we know it's a change of direction, but how do we actually do that? Like we speak, like, okay, you come to confession, is that repentance? How do you actually start confession? And one of the things about confession is that you got to get to a place of thanksgiving, an attitude of gratitude is like your gratitude is in direct correlation with your repentance. Repentance and thanksgiving go hand in hand. If you are thankful for things, then things will start to change in your life. If you're not thankful, then there's no change. There's no transformation. That's why I started off by speaking about transformation. Because if we want trans, why do we attend liturgy? Like what's the whole purpose of liturgy? Is it just, yay, we come down the aisle and take communion and leave? Like, what's the point of liturgy? Why are you coming here? Why you come to church? We heard that the early church father said that the church is a hospital, uh, is a hospital for those that are sick, right? Those that need healing, those that need something changed in their life. So if you're coming for that, then you need to come with a heart of thanksgiving, a heart that is focused on God. Why do I believe that this prayer is a, a prayer of miracles? Because I could tell you, like, I'll tell you, uh, like, a personal story. So, uh, so when, I'm going to say probably about 10 years ago. So I was married. 10 years ago, um, something happened that, like, at my house. I wasn't there, but something happened at my house, and my dad got very upset. I wasn't there. So I don't know exactly what happened, but something happened. So by the time I got to the house, my dad was gone. Like we were there celebrating one of my kids' birthday. And so my dad was gone. My mom was there, but my dad was gone. So I said, where's dad? And all she said was, dad went home. I'm like, okay. Well, maybe he wasn't feeling well. So whatever, we continued the party. And then later on, I called my house or my parents' house just to check up on my dad. And my mom answered. I'm like, mom, can I speak to dad? And she's like, oh, he's like, she gave me some excuse. Uh, he's busy or he's sleeping, whatever it was. I'm like, okay, he's sleeping. I didn't make anything of it. The next day I called to check up and to, and she gave me another excuse. A week went by and like, I'm like, my dad's not speaking to me. And I'm like, okay, well, now it's starting to get fishy. Like what's going on here? So I, so my mom eventually tells me, well, something happened and whatever. And so I'm like, okay, let me speak to him. I wasn't there. Like, why is he upset at me? Like, I wasn't there. Like, you can't be upset at me if I'm not there. So then, uh, anyway, so it went on for a month. And a month goes on and like I tried, but then like my heart started to become like bitter. Like, I'm like, wait a second. I wasn't even there. I'm the one doing all the calls. He's the one rejecting my calls. Like I'm done. Like I'm done trying to call. So I stopped calling. So a month goes by and obviously he's not going to call me. So like two months go by and we're not speaking to each other. And I have no clue what, what went on. Like, I didn't do anything. I, I know I didn't do anything. And maybe that was the problem because I didn't do anything about the nothing that I don't know about. Like, I don't know. I really don't know. So, but whatever. So, but I got really better to the point that I went from calling him to not calling him to coming to a place in my heart saying, like, if he calls me, I'm not answering. Like, I got to that point. Like, that's it. 
And then I used to have like this habit where I'd pray the prayer of Thanksgiving every morning. And I had just slowly realized that I wasn't doing that anymore. And then I said, okay. So I got some advice from my father of confession. And he told me, pray for your dad. Pray and be thankful for him. And I'm like, ah, that's garbage. Like, like I'm not in the right place right now to do that. But I'll do it out of obedience. So I did. And I promise you, when it started, like two days later, my heart went from like, listen, he's your father. If he calls you, you should answer to a day goes by, he's like, he's your father. You should be the one to call him to, he's your father. Go visit him. Like, what changed in my life? Nothing changed. Not, I promise you, nothing, nobody spoke to me. Nobody said, nothing changed other than I came to a place of gratitude, a place of repentance and saying like, okay, he's my father. Like, I got to do something. And obviously, like I went and obviously he embraced me and he loved me and whatever. And we think I, we don't even know what we're arguing about by the time short term memory for both of us. So it doesn't, doesn't matter at that point, but that's why the prayer of Thanksgiving is so powerful and so needed in our church nowadays that when you come to a place and you hear, let us give thanks to the beneficent and merciful God, the father and all these lovely and big, beautiful words. And you probably know this prayer off by heart. Most of us in this room probably know this prayer off by heart. You need to take a stop and say, you know what? I'm not doing this prayer as a checklist anymore. Do you guys know the story of the rich young ruler? The rich young ruler that came to Christ and said to him, what shall I do to inherit the kingdom? What did he answer him? What did Christ answer him? Obey the, Obey the commandments. And what did the young ruler say? I've done that. I've been doing that. He's like, do not commit adultery? Check. Do not commit murder? Easy check. Do not commit, you know, do not steal? Check. Check, check, check. He got them all. And then he said one thing that you lack. One thing that you lack. Why? Because we have brought our life with Christ down to a place of check marks. Did you pray the prayer of Thanksgiving? Check. Do you pray the Psalm 150? Uh, the Psalm 50? Check. Did you like stand and do like your cross in the right order? check like we've we've added all these check marks we've created like this th checklist theology almost in our life and that's ought not to be so i want to tell you when we were in zambia um you know when we were in zambia the the bishop there his name is bishop paul and he came to us at a certain point uh, any of you experience bishop paul no Okay, I hope you experience him one day because he's a wonderful man. Mary uh, and Abuna John know Bishop Paul very well. So asking them stories. But anyways, he came to us at a certain point and one of the things is we were going market preaching. So the group would come and what we would do is we would pray. Some They would do like a skit. He would call it a drama, do a drama and then do a, a short, short talk and then a prayer or something. So that's what we would do. We would go, do a skit, pray, somebody talk, and move on in the next step. And we'd do it and do it and do it. And three we went through three stations till he came to a point and he says, whoa, 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 stop. What are you guys doing? Why is it becoming so mechanical for you guys? He calls us the North Americans, which we are. We're like, you North Americans, why is everything so mechanical? He's like, go and come to a place like of true repentance, come to a place like that you are listening to God's voice, not just to do and like get things done. So it's important for us to come to a place when we're interacting with the liturgy and the easiest part for us to do that is through the prayer of thanksgiving. When you pray the prayer of thanksgiving, pray it. When we say, I thank you, Lord, for every condition and for all condition, oh, take a moment. The priest is the one praying that out loud. You take a moment and say, you know what? I thank you for this, Lord. And I think, and be very specific about things. We're very good at thanking God and saying, God, thank you for everything. And we're extremely good when it comes to our supplications and our needs. We're very detailed when it comes to those. But when it comes time to thanking God for things, it's very hard for us sometimes. It's just easier for us to say everything. We need to be specific about what we thank God 
uh, what we thank uh, God for. Uh, Father uh, Alexander Schmemann, he, he has a quote on the liturgy. He says, liturgical celebration becomes then a blind observance and a meaningless prescription with the, sorry, which, which is incompatible with the definition of worship given by Christ himself. Worship in spirit and truth. The worship of the church thus requires spiritual and an intellectual effort for understand, to understand it. I love this, this quote because a lot of times in Christianity, we think that we're supposed to leave our intellect outside of the door when you walk through the doors of these churches. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that the spiritual and the intellect at the same time are what is needed. You know, when you look at any miracle that's in, in Scripture, any miracle that's in Scripture, you know that who performed the miracle, like in Scripture? Christ, right? It's not a trick question. <laughs> There's no... Christ. Christ performed the miracle. And we know that Christ was fully divine and fully human. And we know that that's the place where miracles happen. Where divinity and humanity meet, that's the recipe for miracles. That's the place for miracles. What do we have? We have the humanity portion. We have a part to do where it needs to start with thanking God. When you look at when he fed the 5,000, what did he start off with? He started off with, I thank you, God. He thanked God. There's always a start, and that start always needs to be this place of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving and repentance, like I said, is a place where there's a direct correlation with your repentance and your thanksgiving. The more that you're able to look and see the glass half full, the more that you're able to praise God, the more that you allow Him to actually have like a place of transformation. It's important for us during this time that you guys are going through Scripture or through the liturgy, that you don't just let things kind of like settle in your mind. It needs to be engraved in your heart. I'll finish with this quote. This quote is a quote from St. John Chrysostom. He says that Holy Scripture were given to us, not that they should be enclosed not that we should enclose them in books, but that we should engrave them upon our hearts. The same thing with liturgy. Liturgy is not a matter of just putting it up on the screen and going through it in order. It's a place for us to actually have these words and these actions engraved uh, in, in our hearts. So I pray that during this time, that when you pray the prayer of thanksgiving, and I know that maybe this may, may be a little bit different than what you're used to with Father John, like that he... Like I didn't go through the words, the specific words of the prayer of thanksgiving. And maybe Father John could do that next week. But what I was saying is like that spirit of thanksgiving needs to be engraved in our heart. That gratitude that you have. You know, there was a person that came up to me. Uh, and she was, she was basically, basically she wanted to commit suicide. Like long story short, she, she came. She's like, I'm done. I'm done with life. I want to commit suicide. And I told her. Listen, let's, 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 let, let's focus a little bit and let's just give, give us one week. And she agreed to it. I said, but all you need to do throughout this one week was to thank God. I want you to wake up in the morning and thank God for three things. That's it. Nothing else. Find three things that you could thank God for. Anyways, the conversation went on and she's like, I can't do it. There's nothing that I could thank God for. There's nothing. There's nothing. She couldn't see it. She couldn't see past like the disaster of her life. Everything from her family to her friends to her work, everything was just garbage for her. So she couldn't come to a place. So anyways, so we went through a, like a long conversation and probably like an hour and a half into the conversation, she said something like, uh, I like running in the morning. I'm like, ah, okay, perfect. I'm like, wake up every morning and thank God for your legs. That's it. Thank God for your legs every morning. You know, that's all you have to do is thank you, God, for my legs. That's it. And she agreed to doing that. And she did it. And I'm telling you, after a week, she came back. She wasn't healed completely. Obviously, she still had, but her demeanor was different. There was a part of her that wants to live. Why? Because all of a sudden, she started focusing on that there is good, that God does do good. In life and that's why the prayer of thanksgiving is so powerful to us because it brings us back to a place of not being focused so much on the negative but being focused on the positive 
and glory be to God forever. Amen.